Celebrating 46 years on the air, award-winning Farm Week is a production of Mississippi State University Extension. Today on Farm Week, a loaded show starting with a way to preserve pollen longer than ever before. In Southern Gardening, geraniums, always popular, now even more so with new varieties. In the markets, Zach dives deep once again. This one looks like a sweet report. And in our feature, a look back on the 2023 Dixie National Sale of Junior Champions. Farm Week starts right now. Hello everyone, I'm Zach Ashmore. And I'm Mike Russell. We're happy you joined us here again on Farm Week. This time of year, many of you may be fighting the pollen and hay fever wars, but of course the big picture is that pollen plays a critical role in feeding all of us. Typically, pollen is fragile, but one company has found an extraordinary way to give it staying power. Colleen Bradford Krantz has more. For at least a century, scientists and entrepreneurs have been trying to figure out how to preserve plant pollen, many types of which die within an hour of being shed. If the problem could be solved, pollen could be distributed whenever and wherever needed. A University of Nebraska small grains expert says some modest progress was made in the past by keeping pollen cold and controlling humidity, but storage life was limited. Those discoveries weren't enough to prevent major yield losses when weather-related challenges hampered the success of natural pollination. We're talking about expanding it from maybe an hour to a few hours or maybe a day. And that's not really long enough if we're trying to make a lot of pollinations or say we have um, a stress window that's occurring the challenge remained. How could these dust-sized particles be collected, preserved, and redistributed on plants in a way that the extensive time and money invested didn't cancel out any financial benefit? I would definitely say that pollination preservation, while we understand mechanisms that contribute to it, we haven't been able to reach our goals at a commercial scale. Power Pollen, an Ankeny, Iowa-based company, says it has not only made progress on preserving pollen longer and maintaining its viability, but they are also able to collect and redistribute within cornfields on a large scale. We got together and really started brainstorming and came up with the fact that pollen is an uncontrolled aspect of agriculture, where it's just left to the weather, the elements, timing. And we felt that if we could build a solid technology around the ability to preserve pollen, that it would be a major step in agriculture that's been a long felt need. Co-founders Jason Cope and Todd Crone, who worked at what was then DuPont Pioneer, now under the name Corteva, decided to start out by focusing their efforts on seed corn production. Not only is corn pollen easier to collect than the pollen from many other plants, but it is also considered a high value crop. Power Pollen's leaders also believed they could save seed corn companies space in their fields by eliminating the need for rows of male plants. Seed production is costly. There's a lot of labor associated with it. There's a lot of land utilization. The, the male is only out there to produce pollen, and then those rows are actually mowed out. So as you start to remove male from the field because you have preserved pollen, now you're increasing the overall productivity per unit of land. The company, started in 2015, now has 30 full-time employees, a half dozen approved patents, and more than 60 others pending. Power Pollen has also landed contracts with two major seed companies. Corteva signed a licensing agreement with Power Pollen in 2020, and Bayer followed in 2021. We've had uh, very successful in-field testing um, to date, and so uh, based on those, uh, those results, we're, we're really excited and, uh, and look forward to our, our continued collaboration with Power Pollen to explore this technology and to uh, better understand how we can integrate uh, the processes and, and, and how it can help us uh, produce a reliable, high-quality seed crop for our, our customers. Working with Iowa-based equipment manufacturer Almeco, 
Power Pollen developed equipment for collecting and redistributing pollen in seed corn fields. They also pinpointed an additive that kept the pollen from hardening into a brick, a problem that would otherwise make application nearly impossible. We store it at four degrees Celsius, which basically slows it down and makes it just real comfortable. And we keep a relatively high humidity uh, so that it keeps its moisture content. We've actually stored pollen now for, it's getting close to two years. Normally it dies within 30 to 45 minutes. The long-term preservation, really we consider that still in the R&D scaling phase, uh, but that is really the ultimate end use for the technology is once we get that process scaled as well, then you can harvest pollen in South America and bring it to North America and utilize it a year later. Cope says their biggest remaining challenge is to reduce the cost of the power pollen process to $50 an acre or less. I think it does seem realistic that there's going to be a point in time where people go, remember when we used to plant our males and females out there and then cross our fingers that they were going to time together well? And I hope they say it's hard to believe we used to do things that way, uh, just because this takes so much risk out of the equation. The company is also focused on wheat pollen, which hides deep inside the plant's head and is more difficult to gather. But experts say the ability to store and reapply wheat pollen could speed up the development of a commercially relevant wheat hybrid in the U.S., a goal pursued for decades. We've got a lot of research going, but we haven't quite reached the point where there are hybrid wheat varieties on the market for U.S. farmers. Hybrid wheat could be a huge game changer. With pollen preservation, we would be able to collect pollen from a field of male plants, maybe somewhere across the state where that plant's already flowering. And then we could take that pollen and pollinate our female plants and get that hybrid seed. Frells says if climate change creates more barriers for natural plant pollination, being able to preserve pollen may become even more critical for many crops. Challenges of climate change have the potential to really affect our seed production. We may need more technologies like this. I really hope we don't, but it's really good that we have these, you know, backups, something to come back to if we are seeing production concerns. On the lighter side, geranium is the botanical name for a group of 280 different species of popular blossoms that bloom from spring well into fall. You'd think that much variety would be enough, but there's a relatively new one that could be your muse. Here's Gary with Calliope geraniums. Some gardeners think that geraniums are old fashioned flowering plants. Today, Southern Gardening is at Rivers Greenhouse and Garden, and these plants are certainly not your grandma's geraniums. Calliope is one of the best and most versatile geraniums available, and it's suited for baskets and containers. These plants have a vigorous semi-trailing and strong branching growth habit and semi-double flowers. Calliope is an interspecific hybrid, a cross between upright zonal and trailing ivy geraniums. Red is by far the most popular color, and Calliope medium dark red doesn't disappoint. This selection has outstanding flower color and is a rich, deep, velvety red. But Calliope geraniums don't stop with traditional red. They come in a wide range of colors. Medium white pops with its pure white flowers. Large Rose Mega Splash Bicolor has intense pink petals that are splashed with a deeper red-pink eye. Medium Pink Flame Bicolor has large light pink flowers with hot pink eyes. Geraniums like lots of sun and are heat and drought tolerant. Always plant geraniums in well-drained potting mix and only water when the mix is dry to the touch. Be careful not to overwater because geraniums don't like wet feet. Feed twice a month with water-soluble fertilizer and don't forget to deadhead for the best flowering performance. Calliope, like all geraniums, look great in containers, combination plantings, and hanging baskets. 
I'm horticulturist Gary Bachman, and I'll see you next time on Southern Gardens. We'll take a quick break, but don't go away. Coming up, the 2023 Dixie National Sale of Junior Champions. It's one of the most popular stories we do every year. The grand finale for young people in 4-H and FFA competing to become champions in this beloved event. Come with us to Jackson, where we'll meet two competitors who epitomize the discipline and drive of Mississippi's hardworking youth. The 54th Annual Dixie National Sale of Junior Champions is coming up. Don't go away. I believe in people and their hopes, their aspirations and their faith. I believe in my own work and in the opportunity I have to make my life useful to humanity. I believe that education is a lifelong process and the greatest university is the home. That my success as a teacher is proportional to those qualities of mind and spirit that give me welcome entrance to the homes of the families that I serve. Because I believe these things, I am an extension professional. I believe in people and their hopes, their aspirations and their faith. I believed that education, of which extension work is an essential part, is basic in stimulating individual initiative, self-determination, and leadership. I believe that these are the keys to democracy and that people, when given facts they understand, will act not only in their self-interest but also in the interest of society. I believe in intellectual freedom to search for and present the truth without bias and with courteous tolerance towards the views of others. Because I believe these things, I am an extension professional. Time for the market report. Prices looking a little bit on the sweet side. And quite unexpected at that. We're talking about the sugar markets, of course, <laughs> taking a bump up this past week. <laughs> but first, the numbers. Slightly down, but not too dramatically. And then, as we've hinted, a deep look into the sugar markets and what makes them tick. And finally, in our row report, what's causing grains to keep falling? We'll look into it. So, markets trending down ever so slightly, row crops on the move while livestock a mixed bag. Let's take a look. Last, last week's biggest loss, lumber down about $18. It's followed by wheat at 13 and a quarter cents. We'll get into why in a bit. Last week's biggest gain, sugar, up one and a quarter cents. Does it seem like much? Well, that's over a 6% increase from the previous week. So, what moves the sugar markets? Where does it come from and what factors affect its price? I decided to take a deeper look. Here's the backstory. Sugar comes from two primary sources, sugar cane and sugar beets. The beets are grown in the northern U.S. because they fare better in cool, wet weather. The more familiar sugar cane is grown in tropical and subtropical environments. It's one of Hawaii's largest ag exports, along with pineapples. The reason these two crops are used is because they both contain large amounts of sucrose. Most fruits and vegetables have sucrose, but only up to about 10%. Sugar beets and sugar cane have 16% and 14% respectively. The largest factors concerning sugar price are global stocks, U.S. dollar price, weather conditions, government regulations, and oil prices. Why oil prices? Because sugar is considered an energy source. Ethanol is made via sugar cane. An energy source's value is determined by its caloric value and current energy price. The price for that is determined by oil. According to Food Business News, the current rise of sugar prices specifically has to do with high demand despite inflation, and Mexico's sugarcane crop yields not as high as expected, but not by much. In other words, supply is lower than demand, therefore, price is up. For the rest of our row crops, wheat dropping in price, as we've said, while corn and soy tag along. Why is this happening? 
Well, according to Elaine Cub, it has to do with a combination of supply on the global market and general market forces. And it starts with a question. Can wheat go lower? Well, I couldn't say that it's never going to go lower, but it's certainly a reminder of what a global market it is because, I mean, that's obviously a, a bearish trade based on better conditions in Russia or guesses about their um, willingness to keep things shipping on the Black Sea without disruption. But it's definitely not a reaction to numbers here domestically in the United States. Kansas was actually putting out some crop condition ratings finally uh, for, for the spring going forward, and it's like 19% good to excellent ratings of their mm -hmm. winter wheat as it's coming out of dormancy and 51 percent either poor or very poor so all of the drought in the southwestern plains of the united states is very much still affecting the united states wheat prospects but that's not what the market is trading the market is trading things from all over the globe so i, I believe there is more volatility to come in wheat one way or another and it could be lower i mean i i, I cannot promise you that that was a low I, I don't think the party's over. I don't think that if, if someone is, is very risk averse that they should necessarily listen to Elaine Cub saying this and like, you know, put all the, bet the farm on this. But I think um, there's legitimate scarcity for feed grains, for corn specifically, maybe less so for the oil seeds. But if you've got old crop corn sitting in a bin that you feel confident that you can keep in condition going into the spring and summer, all of the basis markets, anywhere there's a livestock industry and anywhere towards the Southwest, shows that there is legitimate scarcity. End users really need to pay up for this grain because there's just not enough of it in the old crop market. However, when you start looking towards the end of 2023, once you get past this next harvest, eventually these commodity markets are always eventually going to fall apart and get back down towards the cost of production. But for now, if you've got, like I said, grain sitting in a bin, I don't think the party's necessarily over. In Brazil, that's another good reason to think that some of these markets will eventually start to fall down and why I'm not quite so bullish for the oil seeds is because Brazil does have this record large soybean crop that is being exported right now. So it is relieving some of that scarcity in the global soybean market. Um, but the global feed grains market still has a lot of scarcity. When you talk about that triple dip La Nina that has been affecting South America, Argentina more so than Brazil, that has been cutting the overall South American production more than the Brazilian record high um, yields and, and acreage has been contributing to it. We really have not had much volatility in any of these corn or soybean markets until this sell-off that we've seen just over the past week. The sell-off kind of happened for no apparent reason, just funds, I guess, taking some risk off the table as they're moving around into other assets. So yeah, that probably is an opportunity to take, you know, sort of a mystery in a still scarce markets and, and lock something in. Gosh, the cliche is that a big crop gets bigger and a short crop gets shorter. And there is potential for the Brazilian soybean, mark, or soybean crop to be bigger than 153 million metric tons, which is the last number that USDA came out with. There is a WASDI coming out next Wednesday that could um, probably come up with a number somewhere near that. But as I mentioned just before, it's the cuts to Argentina that are going to have a bigger impact on that global supply and demand table than sort of your shading one way or the other for, for Brazil. And that's it for a deeper look into the markets. Forces on the move sure is an interesting season. Mike. Thank you, Zach. As we do every year this week, we have the 2023 Dixie National Sale of Junior Champions, the 54th time this event has been held. It's the culminating event for lots of eager youth in FFA and 4-H, and for Mississippi's Ag Commissioner, a chance to emphasize the importance of the Dixie National as a whole. Everyone knows that Mississippi's greatest problem is brain drain. Lot number 27, ladies and gentlemen, lot number 27, let's go. It's the loss of our young people to other states. And the legislature's been talking about this, and the governor's been talking about this. Yes! I think we all can agree, and I agree, that is Mississippi's greatest challenge. How do we keep our young people in this state <laughs> as our future leaders? Going up. And I want to tell you this morning, that this junior livestock program don't worry about what you spend the 4-h and ffa young people so the lamb nine thousand dollars our extension and our ag teachers develop young leaders for the future of mississippi and this sale of champions represents the answer to Mississippi's brain drain problem. And with those words, at an early press conference, Mississippi's Ag Commissioner Andy Gibson kicked off the Dixie National Sale of Junior Champions, a beloved annual event showcasing the efforts of young people to raise, care for, and show their animals 
over the last 12 months. This year, nearly 1,300 kids exhibited nearly 2,200 head of livestock. When it was all said and done, 48 animals were sold for a record $456,285, bringing the 54-year total to just under $9 million. Scholarships were awarded too, bringing that total over 54 years to just over a million dollars. All in all, the 2023 sale of junior champions was a big success, the largest sale ever to support Mississippi youth. The long hours, I'd have to say the long hours, but they do pay off in the end. One of those young people is 17-year-old Calden Ratliff out of Stone High School in Wiggins, Mississippi. Headed for a career in meat sciences, he's been showing animals for the better part of the last decade and knows his typical day is all about work ethic. You start the morning out with uh, 6 a.m., you have to go out to the barn, dump feed, then you just have to wait for an hour, then pick it up at 7. But that evening, once you get home right off work, you think, oh, man, all I want to do is lay down. But nope, you got to go right back out to the barn. Sundays and uh, Wednesdays, typically we wash lamb legs and groom them and get them to be extra fluffed. And then uh, closer to the show, show, show weekend, we'll wash them completely and shear them at home. So it's very difficult and strenuous on, on the family. So. A scholarship winner this year, Calden wants to own his own mobile meat processing unit someday, and he knows that what he's learned about work ethic and persistence from showing animals all these years will help chart that course. You have to be very disciplined because some days I don't want to go out there at all, I just want to lay down, but you have to make yourself go out there and continue to continue to improve and work it because if you don't do these things and something bad could happen, that's extra painful. But. You do have to be very disciplined and have to have some dedication to it. You can't just start it and then drop out halfway through. It's a full commitment to the end of the season. Another young person showing up in a big way at this year's Dixie National was 19-year-old Colby Donahue. A graduate of Humphreys Academy in Belzona, Mississippi, Colby wants to be a nurse practitioner. She's been raising animals a long time, though, and had two hogs in this year's sale, earning a total of $16,000. Like Calden, working hard has become a way of life. I think that it has helped me grow as a person to become more of an outgoing person instead of one of the kids that just kind of sits in the corner. I've definitely become more, um, I've definitely become grown to be have more of a work ethic than I would have. I mean, I've learned that if you don't work for it, you don't get it. Because working for it, I mean, in the show ring, if you don't work for it, you're going to be most likely put last. Because if your animal's not, if you can't put your animal or present your animal like it needs to be presented, then it's not going to be where you want it to be. Needless to say, all the kids that get involved in FFA and 4-H are shaped by the years of experience. In the long run, that brain drain that Commissioner Gibson speaks so often about is mitigated by the extraordinary life lessons these kids learn along the way. Well, I think that showing livestock has shaped me, my personality, because, I mean, I'm not the little kid that goes and sits in the corner and doesn't talk to anybody. It's made me more outgoing and want to go meet new friends and want to go and do instead of just kind of sitting in the corner doing my own thing. I'd say discipline, work ethic, how to impress people, such as employers. You can impress employers by being a part of this. Uh, you can meet new friends very easily. Uh, public speaking would be a good one because you have to talk to new people, strangers, and you can't be nervous around them because you have to maintain your composure like a judge. You have to maintain composure and you can't freak out and stutter. After being involved in showing animals so long, there's no question these young people will take a lot of memories with them. After all the hours and planning and fun and even disappointments here and there, a decade of showing animals doesn't exactly fade into the sunset. One of my favorite memories is in Hattiesburg at the District Livestock Show. I got dragged about 50 yards across concrete by my cow. I had a blast, but my grandma come running out of the arena screaming at me to let go, but I knew if I let go, I'd spend an extra three hours there trying to catch it, and I just, I was ready to go home. But it was definitely fun. I'm gonna miss it, just being around everybody and having the relationships that I've made, even with all the little kids. I mean, all my little ones, they all know who they are, and they all come find me every show, no matter where we are and give me the biggest hug and we're all smiling happy 
and ready for the next show. It's definitely a great experience and I recommend everyone to do it. Not because it may be fun to them, but because of what you may get out of it. Because it definitely does help in the long run. Especially if you start at such a young age, you will definitely learn a lot by the time you graduate. Bottom line, after more than half a century, it's pretty clear the Dixie National experience and all the shows that lead up to it is epic in more ways than one. Year after year, young people and all the adults and family members who support their efforts come together in the name of competition, sportsmanship, personal growth, and leadership. You don't accomplish all that without leaving some kind of legacy. So the steer, $18,000. Give our bidders a round of applause. Thank you. And congratulations again to Colin Ratliff and Colby Donahue. Well, next week they call her Miss Ruby and they call her an inspiration. In Lee County, she's the state's longest serving 4-H volunteer. Farm Week's Jonah Holland, a longtime 4-H'er himself, goes one-on-one -on -one with a woman everyone says is everything a 4-H leader should be and who created a museum with memories she's been collecting for 56 years. Miss Ruby, up close and personal, that's next time on Farm Week. Remember, if you missed a story, look for past episodes of Farm Week on our website at farmweek.tv. And don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube as well. See you next week. Thanks for watching.